All right, Paul. We're probably going to need to keep this episode short. Uh, the Terraria update just came out yesterday. Well, from the per from the perspective of us recording the show right now, Terraria update just came out, and our editor Isaac is super deep into it. So he is he isn't going to want to edit this stupid show. In fact, he's probably not gonna like <coughs> that cough. That's probably staying in. He's not going to chop that out. <laughs> we better not make any mistakes. Any more mistakes, I mean. Right, right. Um, so, first up is civil... Oh, wait, no, that's not the first. Oh, we made a mistake already. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do you have to say about this piano business you've written in the show notes, Paul? I was wondering how to do a transition to, and there's just no good way to talk about things that aren't video games on this video game podcast. So I'm just going to talk about it in a bad way, uh, which is by bringing it up. Um, I got a piano today, and that was fun. I, I play piano, and I haven't had a piano in my house for like four years now. I have a keyboard, but it's, it's just not the same. So the thing is, you have like 40 children, and now you have a piano. And in my experience, it is very hard to own a piano in a house with a lot of children because children cannot resist. And I was the same way when I was a kid. Just all those keys just seem to need to be pressed a lot, as often as possible, as hard <laughs> as possible. Just the yeah, power to fill the house with, with toys. Right? Like, just the power to fill the house with noise is sort of this exhilarating thing for a kid. Yeah. My parents dealt with it by making us take piano lessons and practice. And so then we didn't want to because we were being forced to. <laughs> oh, devious. Yeah. Does this one have one of those little rollout lids you can put out over the keys? It does. It folds out. But yes, it has a key dust cover thing. It's even nice. got a lot, but there's no key for it. Right. But that actually helps, just psychologically. Like, when you're walking down the hall, or wherever this piano is, and you see all those lovely, lovely black and white keys, just the temptation is to take your tiny little sticky child fingers and reach out and slam down a bunch of notes as you walk by. But if the lid's there, then, you, then the temptation isn't there. This is just my experience and observation. Yeah, we have already had uh, to, to tell everyone, don't touch the keys if your hands are sticky, because we got it from a, a, um, someone we don't know. So it had been in storage for a while, I think. And so everything was all dusty, and I cleaned it off and cleaned all the keys individually, and then I went to do something else and came back, and there was like these sticky spots on the keys and i was like come on guys <laughs> oh man kids they are amazing <laughs> yeah uh, oh. the thing i wanted to bring up about the piano was that there were a few problems with it there were uh, some of the little uh, wire pins had fallen out and some things weren't quite adjusted properly so i pulled out the action the big you know all the, the levers and and hammers and stuff and um I was just really pleased with how easy it is to feel confident about repairing something when you have like 60 examples of it correctly put together right in front of you. <laughs> right. Right. And it made me think about programming because it's like this is kind of the opposite of programming where like programming you have this void of like not only the screen is blank but like your mind is blank and like you can't see into the computer to see what it's doing. And so it's just like, write some things and see if it works. And and maybe you have some example code, but it's always example code for something that you're not trying to do. It's some other piece of code. You never have like 60 examples of exactly the code you want to write, and then you just got to write the same code again. Right. Oh, by its nature, anytime you have that kind of redundancy, people will be like, oh, I need to build this into a system that can be genericized or whatever. Right. And so then you'll just have one. 
You'll just have one instead of 60 examples. You'll have one that tries to do everything. So it, it's one really complicated one. And if anything goes wrong, instead of a function for every key to make a note, you'll have one function that could make any possible note. <laughs> right, exactly. And I was thinking like, man, it would be so much easier to code if we just built code like we built pianos. Now, it's probably a terrible idea, but it would be easier for programmers. It would. It would. You'd scroll through a lot of code, though. Yeah, sometimes work, <laughs> yeah. working on a project is like working on an instrument where every note is a different instrument. Like, why isn't the C working? I, I copy and pasted the, the code I was using in the trombone section, and now it's not working. <laughs> right. Got all these valves and stuff, and it doesn't work with the hammers. <laughs> right. So I tried posting pasting in some violin code I found on Stack Overflow, and that doesn't work at all. <laughs> you gotta pull it all apart and really understand it. Ah, oh, it's a mess. Oh, it's bananas. Yeah. Speaking of bananas, I am coming in hot this week. I have just exited Civilization VI, and I am pissed off. Uh-oh. Yeah, well, okay, here's a funny story about me getting Civ 6. I was watching some YouTube videos of some creator, of, of somebody breaking the game. And I was like, okay, you know, this is just, it's this long exploit that takes a long time to set up. And when you do, you just get infinite research and instantly win the game. And that's not real fun. But just kind of the game looked cool. And I thought that would be fun to play. So I looked up, how much is it? And it was... Was that the... Was it the spiffing Brit? Because I think I watched yeah. that video too. Yeah. It was a spiffing... Like, it didn't look fun to play the game that way at all. But the game itself looked fun. And I was like, oh, I'd like to play that properly. I looked it up on Steam. Just the base game. It's got a bunch of DLC now, but just the base game was $60. And I'm like, well, mm. the heck with that. Like, it's... You know, it's been over, I think it's been over a couple years since launch. And so, you would expect a discount. So I was like, nah, never mind, I'll just play Civ 5. So I installed and fired up Civ 5, and when I got to the main menu, it's like, hey, get Civ 6 for plus all DLC for $40. Ooh. And, and so, but you, you couldn't get it that way through Steam. This wasn't available on Steam. So... I did that, and I got the game with all DLC, but it's kind of funny. I ended up installing Civ 5 just to basically get a coupon so I could get Civ 6. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It worked out. So I got Civ 6, and the one thing that's been pissing me off since I began playing this way back in Civ 2 or 3 is Barbarians. Oh, Barbarians man. Yeah, are, that, are bananas. That late? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Barbarians have been a problem forever. <laughs> right. But the but the barbarians in civilization, like, they don't just irritate me, they offend me. The rule for every iteration that I've ever played is that barbarians always reach the, always match the tech level of the highest of the furthest ahead tech in the game, right? So, if one person's in the Medieval Age and everybody else is in the Bronze Age, Barbarians will have Medieval units. And that, for a game ostensibly about simulating civilizations, that conceit makes me absolutely crazy. Even when it's not creating setbacks for me, I'm just so angry when I see quote-unquote Barbarians who live in mud huts in, you know, in some godforsaken corner of the map with no resources, pumping out advanced units. It just makes me crazy. And, and like, ostensibly, your civilization should have access to those units too, but you have to research them. But the barbarians don't have to research them. They just get them for free. Why can't you get them for free? Right. And it takes, you know, I've got this complex society. I've got, you know, this massive city with huge production, and it takes a long time to build one of these. And in this game I just played, in, in, I just finished my first game of Civilization VI, and 
you know, I was the most scientifically advanced player on the board, but I hadn't built the, the, you know, I was still rolling around with Bronze Age units. I just had some swordsmen or whatever, but I had teched up to whatever you get just after the medieval age. And so the, the bar, I had or whatever. That, right. And so the barbarians had access to those units, even though I hadn't built any. So these guys were cutting edge thousands of years ahead of everybody else on the map. And some of them came and showed up and just began pointlessly bombing me on my shore. And I hadn't even built any naval units yet. So just somebody in my society thought, huh, it would be possible to build this sort of ship. And then, you know, barbarians show up and begin pointlessly <laughs> bombarding one of my cities. And it's not really like there's nothing in it for them. It's not like they're pillaging to sustain themselves. But then that idiocy was canceled out by their AI being just absolutely stupid. And they just sat there off the coast and let me bomb them until they died. And it's just like, what? how many layers of stupid, that, like... The unit itself makes no sense, then their behavior makes no sense, and the solution made no sense. Why <laughs> is this in a game about, when the rest of the game is so picky about, you know, so cares so much about supply lines and building complex societies with, you know, long chains of infrastructure, and then you just have these units on the board that just summon advanced technology for free. What? Why would you do that? Right, they're they're like they're like clown cars, <laughs> right? Yeah, you're just like pouring out, and and they act like clowns. It's basically like the like the circus thing, right? Like you've got this three ring circus going, and all these things balancing, and all these things happening at once, and then there's just this clown car driving around, like knocking stuff over. Right, and it's like, what is this even supposed to? I can understand early in the game. All right, these are you know just sort of generic hunter-gatherers that just hunt people, okay? I can understand that when you're real low on the tech tree, but by the time you reach the Middle Ages, barbarians aren't really a thing in that way. Like, if you're showing up with advanced units, you are not a barbarian. If you, if you, have, the, if you have the ability to mine, smelt, refine, and shape iron you are not a barbarian you're just a city-state that's filled with assholes well and, i guess you could be like a terrorist or something and, and just like you, buy your technology from the most advanced civilization even though that they haven't built any for their own military yet. <laughs> right right i could understand if they have whatever is the most com they they get access to whatever is the most common unit on the board that would make sense but no they they get super advanced technology that nobody's that's still experimental and hasn't been built yet offends me it's like it's like we we build like the we build the apollo mission right and it's sitting on the launch pad and then we look up in the sky and there's like barbarians on the moon because we have rockets right. so they must have rockets <laughs> And they're just waiting up there on the moon so that they can just murder us for no reason when we get there. <laughs> Man. Neil Armstrong is like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> they get off and there's guys in full Apollo mission spacesuits holding spears to stab Neil Armstrong when he gets when he goes down the ladder. It's just, uh, it's just so is, dumb, right? Right, and this is in every game. The only time it made sense was in Civilization uh, Alpha Centauri. That made sense because the barbarians were just alien, native alien mind worms. And it's like, okay. And they didn't really they can... copy your technology. They, they did advance, but they had their own track. Right. It's like, okay, maybe that's how mind worms work. And I understand wanting to encourage the player to build defenses so they can't just like, hey, I don't need defenses. Uh, but barbarians are just silly. Just silly. So silly. I hate them. If I play through again, I'm going to turn them off. You can do that? Uh, in this, in Civ 6, you can. Oh, nice. I was like, 
I was like, no, I'm not going to turn them off. I'm sure they won't be that stupid in this game. They've been refining the, the re formula. I'm sure here we are six entries into this series, like 10 if you count all the spinoffs like Beyond Earth and, and Call to Power and such. Surely they're not going to have the same idiotic late game. Like in Civ Five. I remember there were barbarian aircraft carriers. And I mean, I just like... <laughs> I see that, and I immediately begin swearing at my monitor, just like, how dare you make something that offensively stupid in a game specifically about simulating civilizations. It's just like in Snow Crash and the Raft, right? <laughs> I forgot all about the Raft. All right. The other thing I really pissed me off about Civ 6 that I'm still really angry about is the the particular expansion I played with had this whole thing with golden and dark ages. And like if you do it like okay, we're in the middle oh, ages. Oh yeah. The game's going to like encourage you the more middle ages stuff you do during the middle ages, the more it will reward you. And if you do a whole bunch of Middle Ages type stuff, then when you move on to the Renaissance, you'll be in a Golden Age for the Renaissance. But if you don't do enough, then you'll enter a Dark Age and your people will like, have all these problems. So I was massively ahead. And it was like, okay, now start doing Dark Ages stuff. And I'm like, I already did all the Dark Ages stuff. <laughs> like, I can't build more, or, or more Middle Ages stuff. I can't do more... I can't build medieval buildings. I've built them all. And it doesn't give you credit for that. You have to build them during the assigned thing. So getting ahead punishes you by making it so that your people are more backward because you're so advanced. That no, pissed no, me it's off, like too. It's like a catch-up mechanic kind of thing. I hate it. I hate it because it specifically punishes the playstyle I like, which is turtle up. And, you know, build tanks to defeat their spearmen. Like, I know this isn't a particularly sophisticated way to play, but I enjoy it. But wow, the game hates my play style. It really, really wants you to play murder all the other human beings in your multiplayer match. Like, that's what this game seems to be tuned for. And this whole stomp all over the AI and make, you know, different, you go for all the different types of victory versus the AI, the game seems to hate that. So I was, I felt like it was sort of punishing my specific play style at every turn. How did you like the, the, um, the diplomatic options? Did you do any of the diplomatic stuff? I mean, uh... I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, they, they still call up with dumb offers, but it's way less dumb than before. You know what? It's not that they call up with dumb offers. It's that they keep making the same offer. Like over, you know, five turns later, it's like, I, already, I said no to this exact offer a few turns ago. Why are you asking again? Um, right. So I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, I just I heard that they had better AI and that like the the diplomacy was much improved in Civ Six. Maybe maybe I heard wrong. They did they they no longer do the thing where they call you up, you know, some piss ant that you could crush if you could be bothered to build the military units to do it. But you don't because you you know you're building your your ascendancy space program or whatever, and they're still you know trying to figure out how to smelt iron. But they'll call you up and make this outrageous demand, like, give us all your uranium for 30 turns and 50 bucks. <laughs> and it's like, no. Like, that was always really irritating in the old games when they would call you <laughs> right. up with an offer that nobody would ever accept. And it was just a waste of your time and this sort of pestering. Um, they did not do that in this game. In fact, all of the the offers that they made were very reasonable. The only time I said no to them was when they went, they wanted open borders and I could tell they wanted open borders because they wanted to go through my territory to fight somebody else. And I'm like, I do not want you clowns running around inside my country fighting each other. No. <laughs> well, 
Yeah. Well, so that's, I, that, that's an improvement. I know in the yeah. earlier Civ games, it was always just, like you said, it was just goofy where they're, they'd make these ridiculous demands or they'd be like, oh, we're so sorry. We want peace. You know, we'll give you the things if you, if you give us peace. And you'd be like, okay. And then like two turns later, they're like, oh, we hate you so much. We're going to war. And it's like, you guys just gave me a bunch of stuff to have peace with you. I, right. Okay. I always like when they call up, prepare to be crushed under the wheels of our army. And it's like, you know, I've got aircraft carriers and they've got... You know, yeah, we're not even using wheels anymore, guys. We got airplanes. <laughs> wheels were so last millennium for us. What are you doing? So, I did yeah. not enjoy, enjoy my first game of Civ VI. I felt like it punished my play style. It had all the things that irritated me about the old games. And it had a lot of cluttered up mechanics that was like, here, worry about this gameplay mechanic that never seems to like do anything for you. Um, there's there fiddling with stuff and it never pays off, huh? Right, fiddling with stuff that isn't very interesting. It's always like, which one of these very tiny bonuses would you like? And it's, ugh. Yeah, did not have a lot of fun. I'm going to give it another go, probably when we're done with this show, but I did not like Civ Six. my first game with it. There you have it, Dark Soul players. Convince Seamus of all the ways he's playing Civ Six wrong. All right. Paul, what have you played in the way of games this week? Why, it's funny you ask that. I have been uh, playing Quern. Q-U-E-R-N. Uh, the, the, uh, the algorithm or whatever over at GOG noticed that I now own a bunch of Mist-like games. It's like, hey, you should buy Quern. It's 50% off right now. I was like, oh, okay. Looked into it, and sure enough, it's a, it's a puzzle game. It's kind of like Mist, only it's... Well, it's like real Mist, where it's, you know, first-person shooter kind of thing, and we walk around except no shooting and puzzles. Right. You have to decide which of the gears do you shoot, right? Yes. Uh, Upgrade except your with gun your mind. to shoot more gears. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's it's kind of I don't know. It doesn't quite have the same feel of quality that the Mist games had. Uh, and having just recently played Mist, it's like there's something about it that that feels polished. It's an old game, and it's not it's not impressive by today's standards, but it's still like. Nicely done. I, I'm looking at the trailer now. I love it. It it looks a lot like Mist in terms of the kinds of puzzles you do. Like you open up this panel and, oh, yep, here's a bunch of weird valves and knobs to turn. And right beside it is a bunch of infrastructure that you have no idea what it does. But you start turning knobs to see what happens. A very classic Mist formula. I love the look of this. It reminds me a bit of the the design of these buildings kind of the domed buildings is gives me a riven vibe yeah it it is very reminiscent of those of those games certainly inspired would you say it's clearly inspired by them i i can't imagine it wasn't it was 2016 so uh had plenty of time to gather inspiration <laughs> plenty of time to say all right i'm waiting for them to come out with another game like le this let's just make it ourselves yeah i, I kind of get the feeling that's what happened although it, it it's a it's a bit different i don't know but it is yeah it is very similar if you liked if you liked mist and riven i think you would enjoy quern and it's on sale on gog i don't know how long the sale is going to last but it's only like even full price it's only like 25 bucks i think this is not bad Oh, I see there's a piece of paper that you read. You know, I kind of enjoyed the original Mist where it didn't need to tell you anything in words. It was all just sort of you infer what what you need to do or what's going on. There wasn't a well, lot of reading there to were, be done. Yeah, there wasn't a lot, but there was some. There was some stuff where it had a paper telling you what to do. But yeah, for the most part, it was 
it was environmental puzzles where you look at something and be like, hmm, I recognize that symbol from that thing over there. Or, oh, if I turn this and this connect to the cables and then go over to this place and I have to flip the switch or whatever. You know, now that you mention it, yeah, I do kind of remember the... There being a bunch... I remember Mist as being a almost textless experience. But I'll bet that's more because I didn't read the text on any of my subsequent playthroughs. <laughs> you know, once you right. know it, you don't need to. You just go straight to the machine and press the buttons. So I've... There was I've a deliberately, little text, but not much. Yeah, yeah. I deliberately ignored the text because I really... I, I don't like that. Yeah, like, I don't like it either. Like it, and, it and feels Korn like it cheapens that. the world. Yeah, yeah. It 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 does put a lampshade on it at least. In Quern, it, the the conceit is that you're there uh, unwillingly at the behest of this guy who's arranged this whole island as a, a, like a a puzzle for you to solve or or something uh, to kind of like lead you through the path that he took to mechanical enlightenment or something. It it's a little odd, but. Uh, it, it puts a lampshade on it, but it does do it, and it, it, it makes it feel, I don't know, it makes it feel like the game designer doesn't trust the player to be able to figure it out. Right. It also, for me, it kills the sense of, like, the difference between, when you meet an alien in a movie, there's sometimes this mystery alien. It's just this shadow in the distance. You don't know what it is or where it comes from or what it wants. And it feels very mysterious. Or it's an alien and it just shows up and talks to you in English. Or talks to you <laughs> right. in jibber-jabber with subtitles. That That's a huge difference in in sort of perception. If you m imagine the the... 2001 except the aliens actually talked to us and tried to explain what they were up to like how much more pedestrian the story would feel and that's what i kind of feel like games when they when they have this wonderful alien world for you to explore but then somebody's written down a bunch of stuff for you to read that explains what all this stuff is i i feel like it it destroys that sense of trepidation and wonder at, oh, what could this be? Uh, and it's even worse because because there are two narration characters, and at the end, at, at, spoilers for Quern. At the end of Quern, you have to make the choice between: Are you going to help the the guy who built all these machines, or are you going to help the ball of light transcendent lady who is telling you to destroy the machines? And uh, and there's some you know political subtext and stuff, and the story and backstory and stuff. But, like, at, at the end, I chose to help the guy who made the machines because at least the guy who made the machines had the courtesy to write down what he had to say so that I could read it <laughs> right. or not read it as I wanted. The ball of light lady, whenever she shows up, she grabs the camera and you and you lose control of your character and of the game and you just have to sit there and wait until she's done talking. And she, like, floats around and your camera just follows her. And, and like, I don't know if that was hard to program or something, but it's certainly hard to sit through. That's it. You grabbed my camera. You're the villain. I don't care what the t I don't care what the author intended. You <laughs> exactly. are an unskippable cutscene. You are the villain, and I must defeat you at all cost. Yeah, yeah. So she, at like most of the way through the game, she tells you the story about how like she and two of her friends were sent on this great quest to save their civilization, and they came here. And it's apparently like time doesn't pass when you're on the island. It's like Narnia or whatever. So when you're there, like, you can spend as much time there as you want. You never grow old and you never get hungry and all that stuff. And so, like, they went there and then they just, like, Goku trained forever until they reached power level a zillion. And then they left and, like, defeated the, the guys and, like, saved their civilization. But then they were too awesome and their civilization just fell apart because they were so awesome that no one wanted a government. They just wanted them to be in charge of everything. And it's like, yeah, but that's not your fault that you were so awesome. Like... That's your culture's it's... fault. They're a bunch of dumbasses. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? And so you? then, like, her her perspective is like, okay, so clearly it's the power of the island that just corrupted the, everything, and, like, we have to destroy the island because it destroyed my culture. And I was like, mm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced. Also, you grabbed my camera. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> there will be no forgiveness for camera grabbing. Yeah. So especially I don't know what else linear... to say about this. Yeah, yeah. especially yeah. just real quick, especially if it's linear and you don't get to probe and ask questions and you just have to listen. Like, you could really take the edge off of exposition by just allowing the player to ask for it. Just that tiny little thing just makes it way easy, it makes it go down much easier. Yeah, yeah. Consent. Just get consent. Right? <laughs> right? It works in so many contexts. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so the game the game feels like it holds your hand too much. It's got um it's got some decent puzzles, but the answers always felt kind of obvious and then the difficulty wasn't in it wasn't even difficult. It was just execution like, "Oh, I see what the solution is. Now I just have to do all the steps to do the solution." And right. Uh I I think there's like a hint system and stuff built into the game, but I never used it cuz like it wasn't necessary. It's was always just like, oh, yeah, okay, this is what I do. And oh, I recognize that symbol from that thing. And it it kind of reminded me of, um, you know, in Riven, how it was it the, the like the big gold dome thing and like it had all those symbols, but like the symbols showed up in other puzzles and at other times. And so it wasn't obvious when you found something if it was the solution to this puzzle or that puzzle or maybe this other puzzle over there you had to kind of really understand what the puzzle was about in order to match the solutions to the puzzles right right it's been a few years it's been over a decade but that sounds familiar or like the number system right like they had that uh, yeah. the little game where it taught you the denis number system and then you had to use that to decode a bunch of other stuff Right, the number system I do remember. In fact, I could probably still write in that number system. <laughs> yeah. Right, because you had to learn it. Right, you had to learn it. You couldn't just brute force it or or just, yeah, whatever. It, it felt like a real number system. And, uh, and this game has a number system too, but the it, it's it's never used in such a way that it's not obvious which puzzle you're working on also the puzzles are presented in in order where you basically get items that are you either you either get items that are keys that unlock things or you get pieces of information which are keys that let you solve puzzles and so there's the, all mm. these keys that you're handling but in order to not have you overwhelmed with keys they just give them to you one at a time and so like you unlock a puzzle you get a new key that lets you unlock the next puzzle that gets you the next key and very rarely did i find any point that there was a branching thing where it's like oh i could work on this or that or the other thing it was always just like oh well here's the next puzzle that i'm working on and that was kind of nice it's kind of like in um in uh, metroid and super metroid where they lock you in a room and they're like you have to solve this puzzle and you can't wander away from it and you can't get distracted because you're locked in there and you've got to solve the thing before you can get out. You have to master the movement mechanic or the wall jumping or this weapon or whatever it is to, to progress. And that feels good because you can't get lost and be like, oh, no, I don't know what to do next because you're locked in there. It, yeah. It also avoids the witness problem where you wander around going, so where's the next puzzle? Right, right. Uh, but Where am I supposed it to has be? the yeah it has the downside that there isn't any there isn't ever anything for you to wonder about it's always just like well I have these tools so these must be the tools that I need to solve this next puzzle right and, uh, and I missed about the I, there's a there's a great comparison I'm sure to be made between Quern and the Witness because even though they're both puzzle games they feel like a very different kind of experience like the Witness is so open and allows you so much latitude and doesn't explain anything and does all this explanation through mechanics and quern is mostly a linear experience that explains most of the things to you and i'm sure that if you if i had asked it would have explained even more to me with the hints and that you can investigate objects and examine them and like click give me more clues about this object and stuff and uh and so there's lots and lots of of hand holding 
and it's almost impossible to become lost. And the puzzles are more integrated into the world. They're not like in the witness, they're like panels, right? And they're they're separate from from the setting. Right. And right. the puzzles in Quern and, and in Mist are are all integrated. They're part of the part of the world that you're moving through, machines and interfaces and ways to lock the door and stuff like that. And uh so I I don't know if one is better than the other, but uh, it was interesting to note that there were those those significant differences. Interesting. One of the things I really love about Quern is that they use almost every item and almost every setting more than one time in different ways. And that That's feels cool. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, well, I don't know if... Spoilers for Quern again, but... Uh, the way you unlock one of the the doors is there's this this box with a bunch of blocks in it a, a block box i guess and it's got a cage you know so you can't take the blocks out you can just slide them around and so it's like a sliding you know move the blocks around until you get them in the right position and then you get this one block this different one that's obviously like made of metal or something and you slide it over into a into a, a little weight and then that weight drops down through the floor and then it's like okay and it, you know it pulls on the rope and opens the door and so like, okay cool so you go in and do some stuff and then later you find a picture of uh, like a pictogram of that box and then some symbols and it's like oh that's weird and if you go back to the box and you get out your there's like this blue light that you can shine on things that reveal secrets it reveals that the whole time there were these symbols on those blocks and you just couldn't see them because you didn't have the blue light oh, the whole time right, and now you right. have to slide the blocks around to make that pattern with the symbols and you know get them in the right orientation and then it'll unlock a thing and it, it and like a little side panel pops out of this box that was always there like you could see there was this little side panel it's like oh what is that i don't know you know maybe it's just you know flavor it's just geometry that you know the, the modeling guy put on there no it's not that's a part of the puzzle and like it pops out and there's a key in there and you take the key and go do something else and then you forget about that puzzle and you go down this big elevator and there's a whole you know whole thing and you get underground and you're walking around and you come across this thing and it's this rope that has a box in it and it's got that brick in it <laughs> and the brick that you would drop down from up above now you pull the brick out, you have to do another little puzzle, and you pull the brick out, and in the back of it are these electrical contacts that you can use to plug into another thing to solve another puzzle. And it was just like, oh, so good. That's cool. That's cool. And a lot of the things in the game are like that, where you'll use something, and then later you'll come back to it and do, use it in a different way, or, or turn it around, or... Uh, you know, punch in a different code. There's like a button panel with a bunch of symbols on it. You'll punch in a code and it'll slide over and it's like, all right, I did solved it. And then later you'll come back and punch in a different code and it'll give you another thing. And it's it it's really cool how it how it uses those. And I really like the way they designed it that way. This sounds like one of those games that, you know, would be ripe for speed running. Like if you know all these solutions what would normally take you six hours will take you six minutes kind of thing. Oh, well, we could go yeah, over here and find out what these... Sim yeah, uh, but I don't need to get the blue light because I just have memorized the pattern that you put these things in. So you put them in that pattern and skip a bunch of puzzles. You know, I wonder if the game allows for that. Because I love when games do that. I, I love when you're allowed to sequence break if you've been through the game before and you know what's up. Yeah, and I know it does... Uh, allow for that because um, while I was playing, it, it does auto saves. And while I was playing, the the game crashed right while it was auto saving, and so it corrupted my auto save. And so I had to reload Oops. from quite a ways back. Uh, and yeah, and that's annoying. But then I just went through and solved the puzzles that I had solved in the meantime from memory because I already remembered how I solved them. And so I was like, I don't need to you know look at the you know go get these intermediate things. I'll just do it right you know straight through. And uh, and later on, I was looking at the achievements, and one of the achievements is to solve one of these puzzles without ever using the the blue light that reveals a secret code. And so you can just go over and enter the code in, and it'll it'll you know let you in. So uh, I would be interested to see a, a speed run or something. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Huh? Yeah. Now I, now I want to see if that's something. I'll, I'll probably look it up over the after the show. Or when I'm putting together the show notes, because I'm curious if that's a thing. 
Yeah. All right. What do you say we do some mailbags? Let's do it. Hello, Seamus. Hello, Paul. And hello, Isaac. Oh, this person has failed to take into account the fact that Isaac is probably playing Terraria. <laughs> you are famous for nitpicking on games everyone else loves. All right. Let's be honest here. This is mostly me. <laughs> That's my sin. <laughs> It's, this is a parenthetical. Paul and Isaac are parentheticals to this question. Right. Uh, the two examples here are the New Colossus and ME2. Do people really like the New Colossus? I don't know. I won't argue the point. But there are, are there any examples of the other way around? Are there any games, even board games or card games, you love which everyone else hates? My example would be Dragon Age 2. I read Admiration for Origins Everywhere and Hate for the Second Series Entry. It's pretty much the opposite for me. Paul, you mentioned playing games with your kids last week. Do you ever get to play the good old rage-infusing hot seat, hot seat modus of worms? Regards, Lars. All right, that's a two. this is two questions. You've cheated, Lars. You've cheated in an extra question. So I will, I will answer the first question first. Um, are there any games that I love that are the less popular? I have, I have this vivid memory of writing something about a game out there that I wrote, oh, they changed this series to appeal more to casual fans like me. And I like it, but I understand why it alienated the, the, the main player base. And I can't for the life of me remember what game that was. But here's a, here's a couple other examples. One of them is Bully. I think Bully is my favorite Rockstar game. And nobody cares about Bully. Nobody remembers Bully. People will go way back to Grand Theft Auto 3 and play that and speedrun that and obsess over that and make mods for that. Nobody cares about or plays Bully. But I, I liked it. It was like way less mean and cruel than in just ugly compared to other Rockstar games and I actually kind of liked the the school setting and I, I really wish we'd get another game like that it even had a bit of collect-a-thon where you had to find every kid in the school and get their picture for the yearbook I I had fun doing that I liked the kids in the school it was cool so that's my example now Paul the good old rage-infusing hot scene modus of Worms. Are they talking about the Worms games? Yeah, Worms, Worms Armageddon, Worms World Party. There's a bunch of them. Right. I owned some of those, but I, I didn't have any friends. So I played it against the AI, which is probably <laughs> the least interesting way to play that game. There's just no joy in beating the AI. Because you know, for the computer, it's trivial. It's extra work to make it miss. <laughs> like, so yeah. every time you win, you, by definition, the computer very obviously let you win. So there's absolutely no joy in it. I think they're not very good at using the the grappling hook rope thing. Uh, the AI can't use that very well, if I recall correctly, because it, it relies on the physics system and it has to, like, for whatever reason, it's hard to program the AI to do that efficiently. Right, right. So I remember getting very good with the rope and like ninjaing over and dropping a grenade on the guy and then ninjaing back to a place where they couldn't get to me. And you can, it's possible to beat the AI even at the very difficult settings where they're, there's just death if you're in line of sight or, you know, ballistic. Where they're just perfect aim bots. Yeah. Um, I remember way before Worms, well, I don't know, way before, but, like, uh, we used to play Scorched Earth, which is like a, a tank game. Do you ever play tank games when you were little? Uh, well, they didn't exist until I was an adult, so no. I mean, unless you're talking about... <laughs> okay. Unless you're talking about Battlezone, which, well, there's... <laughs> there's That's a not game exactly a ballistics well. game. No, it is definitely not. Uh, but Scorch, have you ever played Scorched Earth? 
I have not played Scorched Earth. I have played games that were 2D, you know, side view, where you're, you know, it's a, it's you versus another human. Which of you can eyeball a parabola better? There'll be some obstacle yeah. in them. I mean, there were a lot of these in the in the late 80s, early 90s, where you've got a tank type thing on your side of the board and they have one, and then there's like some sort of wall or mountain between the two of you, and you have to lob shots at each other. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, Scorched Earth was the one that I got into, I'm not sure why, one of my friends got a shareware copy or something, and uh, or or someone bought a copy and then like shared it all around so we all had it. Um, but they, it's a, there's a bunch of different weapons. There are rollers that roll down the terrain and there's gravity. So the terrain falls when you shoot it and it, you know, it collapses and, uh, you can have different modes. There's a bunch of different play modes and a bunch of different weapons and they cost money and you can have multiple rounds where you gain money for blowing up tanks and then buy better weapons. So that by the end you're shooting like MIRVs and, and laser beams and all kinds of stuff. Wow. Those games have gotten pretty sophisticated then. Yeah, it was fun. Um, but I remember when I was when I was playing it, we would play, my brothers and I would play together, and after a while, no one would play with me because I was good enough at it that I could just, you know, we'd start off and we're just shooting with normal tank bullets, and I'd be like, okay, well, that's going to be like, you know, 14 degrees and, and 85 energy, and, and just like lob it right on top of people, and I remember one time there was, it, it has wind too, so like if the wind is blowing from a certain direction, it'll it'll blow the shots and there's air resistance and they slow down as they shoot. You can adjust the air density and all that stuff. Um, but there was one time when when there was wind against me and I, I shot like backward over the mountain and it arced over and hit my brother and he's like, I'm not playing with you anymore. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Do you ever think of going pro? Well, I, I, there wasn't... There wasn't going pro when I was little, only after I became an adult. <laughs> so, uh, so I grew up with playing games like that, and then Worms was kind of like this cartoony, you know, everything's huge. Like in in uh, in the games I'm used to, in, in Scorched Earth, uh, all the shots were a single pixel, and like everything was had to be pixel perfect, and you know, like your tank was maybe like eight pixels wide or something. And so in Worms, you're, you know, you guys are just huge and they're huge cartoony and they shoot giant cartoony bullets and everything's kind of goofy. And so I never really took it seriously because it was just like, oh, this, this looks like a goofy interpretation of something that I'm already familiar with. And so like, right. okay. Uh, and there were some in college that I played that were like uh pay for cosmetics or something it was like some sort of korean i forget what it was called some sort of korean game that was that same kind of idea where you get tanks and then you've got like fancy different kinds of guns and things um but it, it i guess to make a long story short too late uh no i haven't played those kind of games with my kids it's just as well that sort of thing will destroy a family Kid, especially considering your skill level imagine your kids will be in therapy you know years later explaining to their therapist <laughs> how you'd make them lose on the first turn by just wiping them out before they even learned how to play you heartless bastard so side story uh today we were telling my youngest son cody to it, he, he was supposed to be cleaning the yard you know picking up the toys out of the yard and putting them away and he's like, I can't do it alone. I need someone with me. And I was like, Cody, you just you're just saying that because you want someone else to do all the work for you. Like you can do it. You're just lazy. And he's like, No, I'm tired. I'm so tired. Okay, Cody, you can go. You can go to bed if you want. In fact, I think it is time for you to go take a nap. So go take a nap, and when you get up, you can clean the yard. And so he's walking to his bed. Oh, this is why I want a new mom and a new dad. <laughs> That's awesome. The, the so I was like, Cody, say. you can't get a new mom and new dad. You're too annoying and you're whining too much. If you want a new mom and new dad, you got to behave properly. And, and that got him to quiet down. It was amazing. Well, that's harsh. 
yeah, well. Obviously, my kids aren't uh, aren't that thin-skinned. <laughs> <Pretty. laughs> right? He can dish it out, he can take it. Dear Diecast, Recently, link in the postscript, Egosoft, creators of the X Universe series, talked about their switching to using Blender and how it makes it easier for modders to create new things for their games. Wow, I didn't know that. Do you guys think we will reach a point where games using prolific tools like Blender will be malleable enough that instead of buying new games, players who want to play something new will just install different mods like Bethesda games taken to the extreme? Veil, vale, Tim. And there's a link to the article. So this is sort of a risk. This is already happening. Uh, City Skylines is a great example of this. Every once in a while, City Skylines will put out like a new content pack. And it's like, here's a bunch of new buildings. Like maybe you want to have a Japanese district in your city or whatever. And you can buy this pack. And then, you know, you can make a district or your whole city look like this. And... Like, who would buy that? There are 10 bajillion buildings on the the Steam Workshop. Anybody can... You can just download them for free. People are just pumping out brand new high-quality models for this game in Blender. And it's apparently super-duper easy. Uh, especially since the game is made in Unity and um, importing models from Blender to Unity is super easy. It's not fair to say that Blender is the like native editor, but it's certainly the for for models in Blender, but Blender does have built in just straight up ability to read blend files and automatically convert it into the Unity system. Really? I didn't know that either. Yeah, you can it'll read a blend file directly. Neat. No conversion, even though they have very different coordinates like Radically they're like one of them is Z up and another one is Y up. That's how so totally different axes and You know you have to like rotate the model and flip an axis I think to go from one format to the other, but you know it, that's not a difficult operation to do <laughs> It's very trivial and uh, So yeah, you can read blend files. I just drop a blend file into your unity project and you can immediately drag it into the screen, and boom, there it is. And, Man, uh, I gotta start using Unity or something. That sounds it's, pretty cool. It's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, we're already that. This is already happening. Where a lot, I'm sure a lot of people aren't buying DLC for City Skylines because there's no way they can um, compete with the much larger and completely free stuff that's available on the you know from just bedroom developers so yeah yeah wow the the one thing i think will limit this sort of thing is after a while you don't want more content you want different game you want the gameplay to evolve or change like civilization you know if the community was just adding more and more and more leaders or more buildings to civ 6 that's fine. That would keep the game in interesting for a while. But sooner or later, you're going to be like, I want a new sieve with new mechanics. And you can't make new mechanics in Blender. Or or you want to play Alpha Centauri or something. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I suppose you could still do it with modding, though, right? Like... Uh, if you could mod the game, like in, in Kerbal Space Program or something, where you can drop in C-sharp code to modify the behavior of the game and, you know, make different parts that do different things or new types of engines or new types of resources and things like that. Kerbal Space Program uses C-sharp? I thought it used Lua. Yeah. Oh, no, man, KSP is in, is in Unity. I'm glad I didn't know that, or I probably would have lost six months in my life to to messing around with that. Oh no, yeah, yeah, it's it's all in Unity. It's it, it all uses C sharp. 
it's kind of a weird, it's not like a modding system, it's like a weird system that, like, you just drop C-sharp code into the mod folder, and then it tries to incorporate it when it runs. So it, it's not like it exposes interfaces, it's just like, it'll run whatever code you want. Oh, that sounds insecure. Yes, very insecure. Yeah, I, I, my dream is, is for a modding system that will sandbox all mods, but without any performance concerns and without limiting the <laughs> modder's ability. And I, right, why right. haven't they made that yet? Why, why haven't they done that yet? I don't understand. Just boot Just, up a new virtual machine for each mod. Right, right. They'll all talk to each other on internal network sockets. And it won't have any performance impact. Somebody needs to get on this. Dear Diecast, how's it going, fellas? Cheers, Derek. Okay, P.S. Actually, I have another question. O okay, to, to answer the, the first question before I go on to the second one, I'm doing good, but I'm still pissed at Civ 6. How are you doing, Paul? I'm feeling pretty good. My allergies are starting to kick up, so I'm probably feeling almost as bad as you do every day. <laughs> oh, that's bad. I hope you get well soon. Thanks. Okay, Seamus mentioned recently that games like Dark Souls can make him really, really angry. So I wonder, what is your berserk button, Paul? And how do you deal with anger management if the game is really driving you nuts, but at the same time you really want to finish it? Or maybe you never get angry at all. Hmm. I don't generally have an anger problem. Um, if I if I do get angry and frustrated with things, it's usually with physical things where I'm uh, I'm trying to make a piece of of steel do what I want, or there's something that's broken. I'm trying to get you know, get a screw out of something or trying to solder two very stubborn pieces of tin together or something it's some kind of like physical thing the smoke's going in my eyes and the you know the, the oh, yeah. saw blade keeps skipping off of the thing or it keeps twisting sideways in the vice or whatever and it's just like you know trying to get physical things to do what i want uh with games it's it's not that big of a deal because like I do them for fun, so if a game isn't working properly, I'm just like, well, I guess I'm not playing this anymore. And, it, you know, if a game isn't fun anymore, or if it's not interesting, or it's not engaging me, I'm just like, well, I guess I'm not doing that. I'm going to alt-tab to something else, you know? So so I, I feel like I don't get uh, really locked into it so much. Although, when I was younger, when I was like eight or nine, I remember playing Privateer, and... Uh, I spent. A, I think I may have shared this on the show before, but I spent a long time doing a, a run where I was supposed to pick up some grain at some place and then like fly it over and drop it off somewhere else. And when I got to the destination, I found out that I'd forgotten to load the cargo at the origin. And this is back when like you know you got to like switch CDs when you're going through warp gates yeah. or whatever, and like it'd take 15 minutes to load. And I only had a certain amount of screen time, so like. I used up all my time playing this game and like spent all this time flying across the galaxy or whatever and then found out that I had wasted all my time and I broke down in tears. I was really I was really upset. I wasn't angry though. I didn't want to destroy something. It was just like I was disappointed in myself. So I, I think I'd probably get disappointed in myself more than I do get upset at, at games. Huh. Well, I take the much more realistic um, response, which is I can't possibly have made a mistake. I'm the human. You are the subservient machine. So obviously you fucked it up. You stupid <laughs> game. How dare you waste my time. And, yeah. uh, and sometimes and that's really, true. And sometimes these games are just insolent. And you have to let them know by shouting at the monitor. That's the, that's the only way to fix it. It's the only way to let the game know it's doing something wrong, so it can learn. Uh, okay, I do sometimes get frustrated when I am trying to debug a piece of code, and I know that I have not made any errors in programming this piece of software. I know that the computer is is behind the scenes, changing my code, 
and making it do things right. that I do not want it to do. And that right. that does upset me um, until I find <laughs> that I actually have. Actually, it was my mistake. And, and it's not like I even work with anyone else. It, like, I wrote all this code. I did this to myself. But it doesn't stop me from being angry at the computer from time to time because it just feels <laughs> like it's not my fault. It can't possibly be my fault. I know exactly what I meant when I typed that code. Why do you continue <laughs> right. to do the wrong thing, computer? How dare you? Disobedient uh, it reminds computer. me of the the XKCD wishing well comic. Do you remember that one? No, no. Tell it to me. It's uh it's the well it's the wishing well of uncomfortable truths and so, like you throw a penny in and it tells you something and you know, like she never really loved you or something like that, right? Oh, and right, so, right. And the punchline is the guy throws a coin in and it says, you'll never find a programming language that frees you from the burden of clarifying your ideas. And he says, oh, but I know what I mean. <laughs> right. Oh, it's so true. Although I just, I feel like I've made, become so happy since I learned C sharp. And at the same time, I feel like I'm being really irresponsible. It can't possibly be this good. It can't possibly last. Like, after years of driving an 18-wheeler, I've discovered this fun little go-kart. And everybody's like, no, the go-kart, it can't pull all that stuff you need to do, and it can't do all this. And I'm like, whee! <laughs> Bye, losers! <Right. laughs> I do, I love it so much. I find myself thinking, I should just, I should just start program. I don't even have anything I want to do. I just want to program in C-sharp because it's so, so easy. Hmm, yeah. That's, that's how I feel about Python. Although I have not learned the hard way uh, as you have, to, at least not to the same degree. Oh, you didn't like spend years toiling in the yeah. in the years toiling in C sharp or C C yeah C plus yeah. plus. I I did take one C plus plus programming course in college, but that's like the extent of it. I think if I was going to program in C again, I would just give C plus plus a pass and go back to v vanilla C. I have happy yeah, memories I'm sure of programming. Yeah, that's what a lot of people do. C. Yeah. I don't know, there's something that made me happy about it. Of course, the the problems, I have happy memories of C, but the problems I was solving back then were also way simpler. So this could be a, you know, nostalgia talking rather than experience. Like, I, right. I remember, yeah. And weren't the good old days great when... Programming languages are so easy. Well, no, actually, it was when you didn't have any responsibilities and all your problems were simple. Right. Right. When everything was easy to do and you didn't have... Um, or it was easy to do because you didn't have much to do. Because you weren't aiming very high. Right. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. Although, I know... Uh, I think... Doesn't Jonathan Blow program his, his compiler in C? Or is he using C++? I don't remember. That's a really good question. I'm actually... Isaac, stop playing Terraria and, cu and cut this out of the show. <laughs> I, think he, I think he does use C++, but he doesn't use any of the C++ features or something like that. I just realized I'm not going to be able to... I was going to Google for this. But I have no idea where it's probably if he talked about it, it's not going to be in in an article. It's going to be buried in the middle of an hour long video. There's no <laughs> way I'm going to find it here on the show. But I'm honestly curious if he went back to somebody that hears this podcast has heard the truth. Please post your recollection of the truth or your approximation of your recollection of this truth. Because I am very curious if he went back to ANSI C or if he was doing C++. All right. Paul, we've definitely done a show. It, it happened just like that. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question that you'd like us to tackle on the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. 
Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, and thanks for all the questions targeted at me and not to Seamus. I really appreciate it. Not that there's anything wrong with Seamus, but it's just nice to have some questions that I can answer. Okay, so Seamus, I know where you can get a copy of, of Jai. Like, you've been wanting to program in Jai, but nobody has a copy of it yet, right? Okay. You just need to become a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>